So yes, at the uh, Western Wall, they you know have their the Slichot service, and as part of the service, they are uh, blowing the shofar, which is the, the call to prayer. And um, David will go into this a little bit more, but this is really what 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 happens here um, during this uh, during these periods and, and moving up to uh, to Rosh Hashanah and the High Holidays. So just to give you a little taste, um, I wanted to show that. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining tonight. And um, I do hope you and you find this program very meaningful. Uh, and I want to introduce David McCrutman, a very, very dear friend. Uh, David was, is really probably one of the first people I met when I moved to Israel uh, 16 years ago. He's been involved in Jewish and Christian relations for years. So he used to work with the uh, in, in New York at the consulate, um, worked here at the Center of Jewish Christian um, understanding cooperation is a leading the the theologian, uh, speaks all across the United States for to different churches, and is um, just an, an, ex an amazing teacher. And I love to have him. He meets with a lot of our groups that, that come on a Friday night that want to learn more about Shabbat and comes to the hotels and joins us for Shabbat and walks us through a, a beautiful program. And um, I think you'll all enjoy what David has to say tonight. So welcome, David. Hi, everyone. As we're fulfilling the biblical prophecy, uh, bring God's word from Zion. So we are doing this prophecy together. Um, we are in the biblical season. I want to make this very clear. It's not a Jewish season. It's a biblical season as outlined in Leviticus chapter 23. You'll see the biblical holidays that are listed that include what you know as Rosh Hashanah, the, the biblical new year. That is the birthday of humanity, followed by the Day of Atonement, which is on the 10th day of the Hebrew month of Tishrei, which this is the month that we're in, followed by the Feast of Tabernacles. All those three biblical holidays are universal in nature. That means anyone who is a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob should be celebrating this. I'm not saying you need to do an Orthodox Jewish practice of it. And this is the part of the, uh, I'm not asking you to go into huts for seven days and, and, and do this. What I am saying is um, the universal nature and the theology of it, you may want to consider adopting into your lifestyle with God, not as in any particular thing about salvation, but as a way to show that this is a special period that God put on the books, a schedule appointment with humanity, waiting for humanity to reflect on God's kingship. That's Rosh Hashanah, our renewal to do God's kingdom work. And if we're accepting God in our lives, then it's a happy season. So Rosh Hashanah is really a happy day because this is the birthday of humanity. It's also a renewal of our commitment of the kingdom of God. But once we are renewing that commitment and God is God, we need to reflect as humanity, as the world, where are we with actualizing the kingdom of God on earth? And so the Day of Atonement is an opportunity for the world to see where they are with God. And if we're not living up to our holiness and sanctification of his will, then we need to contemplate as to why we're not living up to that. What do we need to improve? Then... Uh, God provided a great miracle uh, many, many years ago when the nation of Israel, along with the mixed multitude that went out from Egypt in, Genesis, in Exodus chapter 12, when we know about mixed multitude, these, these included the high royalty of Egyptian society, along with other slaves that were not Jewish. They all went out with, a remnant went out with the children of Israel, and they survived. 40 years in the desert. So this is an opportunity to contemplate and thank God for his protection because in impossible situation, there was the possibility of living. So this is the biblical season in, in a very short summary of everything. Uh, for those who are into Hebraic roots, you know that on Rosh Hashanah, and you just heard this in the video that Elisa uh, showed to us, you hear the shofar. So on Rosh Hashanah, the only biblical mandate that we, we see is the blowing of a sound. And then the tradition is that that sound is then played on a shofar. 
made of a ram's horn. And that shofar is supposed to be like an alarm clock to wake you up to saying, hey, the king, this famous expression that we have in Judaism, the king is in the field. That means king, that God now is more amplified than any time beforehand to, hold on one second. Do you need this? Yes. Okay. My wife, my wife needed something. Okay. Now back to our broadcast. Okay. So we have this opportunity of the alarm clock waking us up to know that this is the kingdom of God day. This is our, this is the birthday of humanity. And then we are in this introspection of our lives with God and the day of atonement. We know that uh, according to Jewish tradition, when it says in the verse, we need to afflict ourselves on this particular day in Leviticus chapter 23, that affliction has been interpreted through the revelation of the sages to include fasting, as well as not bathing for pleasure on the day, not wearing comfortable leather shoes, as well as not to be intimate if you are married, not to be intimate with our spouses on that day. This day is supposed to be specifically for prayer and then ask and, and saying sorry to God for where you have not lived up to your will to bring God in the world and showing people about God and where are we are in our faith community together. So this is where we are specifically. Now, I just want to show you, I have the ability to share, Elisa, right? Yep. Okay, great. So let me go to our specific liturgy that we use on the shelf for blowing. So as anything in Judaism, uh, there are many different types of arguments as far as what particular sound do we need to have from the shofar. And there's a short sound and there's a little bit of a longer sound and there's a much longer sound. I'm not gonna go into the sounds of the shofar. Really, we incorporate all those sounds and that's what you've been hearing uh, on the shofar in the slichot, that, uh, the prayers that Elisa Mo was showing. But in our liturgy, when we hear the, each section of the sounds, we say the following liturgy. This day is the birth of the world. This day stands all the world's creation, stands them as sons or as slaves. If as sons have compassion for us, as a father has compassion for his sons. And if as slaves, our eyes are raised, until you show us favor and bring us out like the sunlight, awesome and holy. These are two pronouns for God, God's name. So we see that we have two paradigms of our relationship with God, one as a parent to a child and the other to a, a master to a servant. We hope that we are in the season where we are more like children to parents as opposed to servants to masters. And, and the relationship is very, very different. Let's say, for example, your parent owns a company and then employs you. You can go straight to the CEO, thus your parent, knock on the door and say, hey, you wanna have lunch with me? The parent will say, sure, no problem. The child doesn't have to go through middle management to make that appointment nor through the secretary. The child just shows up at the door and says, hey, let's go. As opposed to a servant to a master, if you want to have any time with the master, there would be middle management bureaucracy. But we wanna cover both of our sides here in the paradigms of our relationship with God, not knowing what the season is. So we cover from the point of a child to a parent, as well as to a servant, to a master. But the point here is this day is the birth of the world, not the birth of creation of the world, but the birth of humanity. The first human being was created on Rosh Hashanah. All the other days were leading up to that time, right? So that is what we're celebrating on Rosh Hashanah. And when I want you to look at Rosh Hashanah all the way till the Day of Atonement, specifically on the Day of Atonement, we are acting as both prophet and priest. I know this, I know, now I want to make this very clear. I know as, as Christians, you are as a Christian, believe that Jesus is both prophet and priest. Now, I'm not coming from that point of view. I'm coming from the point of view of the Hebrew Bible and looking at, the, and looking at these holidays from a perspective of a prophet and priest. First, I want to sort of differentiate between the office of the priest and the office of the prophet. The archetypes of the priest and the prophet are, are represented by Aaron, who is the priest, and the prophet is represented by Moses. All right, so the priest, in order for you to become a priest, you just have to have a father who's a priest. It's a dynasty. 
a prophet, for example, for example, Moses was a prophet, but we don't hear any of his kids being prophets, right? It's a gift. It's a calling. So there's a difference between that. So it's not automatic that you're born into a family of prophets that you will be a prophet. The priesthood is very much bureaucratic, whereas a prophet is charismatic. Only men can be priests, but women and men could be prophets. We know this from Sarah and Rebecca and Leah and Rachel and Deborah. I could go on and on to the many, many prophets that are mentioned in the Bible, both for men and women. The priest, if you're a regular priest and you're working in the temple, you have four major uh, garments for the uniform. If you're the high priest, there are eight garments. For the prophet, no official clothing, no sponsorship from Tommy Hilfiger or Versace, all right? Basically, whatever, it could be a shirt and jeans and that you could be have the prophet. The priest has a very detailed oriented job. There is a job description, but the prophet really is based upon divine intuition. He has to really see what's going on in, in the world uh, and what's happening to the nation of Israel. And the priest is dealing with cyclical time. There's specific times that the priest is gonna be utilized to do certain services but the prophet is really looking at time as, as a journey. Where is Israel in its relationship with God and with each other? So I bring this out because it's going to be very important because what, are, what Jews are doing after the second temple was destroyed is fusing both the office of the prophet and office of the priest. Now, there is, I'm going to prove my case to you. There is specific vocabulary regarding sin and atonement for a priest, and there's going to be specific vocabulary for a prophet regarding sin and atonement, right? So for the priest, we're going to go to Numbers chapter 5, and, and it says there, the eternal spoke to Moses saying, so I just want to point this out to you. In Hebrew, this Hebrew word, yud heh vav uh, which you usually pronounce as Yehovah. I only do this for educational purposes, but Jew Jews do not pronounce this name out of reverence. We say Adonai when we're, when we're learning or we're praying, uh, but we just usually say Hashem to represent this four-letter Hebrew word of God, but it's a fusion of past, present, and future. That is what that name represents. So that's why I translate as opposed to Lord or God, the eternal. So I just want to give you that little nugget I'm throwing out there. So this four-letter word of God in Hebrew is past, present, and future. God above time. So the eternal spoke to Moses saying, tell the children of Israel, when a man or a woman commits any of the sins against man to act treacherously against God, and that person is found guilty, they shall confess the sin they commit and make restitution for the principal amount of his guilt, add its fifth to it, and give it to one who against whom is guilty. Now, I put here a very, uh, I put the red uh, uh, font here, sorry, uh, let's go back, the red font here, which really, there's going to be a word named vidui in Hebrew, which means confession. The point of a priest when it comes to sin and atonement is to help the person who's bringing the sacrifice to confess. When the high priest is doing all the work on, on the day of atonement, he is acting as confessor for the people. So this word of confession only applies to a priest and you will never see it with a prophet. This is very important, the vocabulary of it. All right, so again, the priest's job is to make sure that I, as a person who's moved to do repentance, I am then bringing something to the table and the role of the priest is to help me confess for it. The priest is not there to make you repent. You are already supposed to come into a state of mind to repent. Once you're in that state of mind to repent, then there's rules and regulations as far as this repentance is concerned when the temple was standing and then there was a whole job description that the priest had. But the main focus is confession. Let's continue with another, and there's going to be two other vocabulary words that is connected to the office of the priest that you will not find with the office of the prophet. We go to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 21. This is actually um, when the high priest is involved in, on the day of atonement, for being, for the confessor, for the Jewish people. And Aaron shall lean both of his hands upon the goat's head and confess. 
and upon it all the avonot, which is a category of sin of the children of Israel, all their pishayim, which is another category of sin. This is the reason why I'm leaving it in the transliterated Hebrew, and all are their chatatam. So we have avon, pesha, echet. Those are the singular for what you see in the plural. But these are categories of sin. Not every, just like you have in the American justice system, someone who has uh, first degree murder, second degree uh, murder, um, homicide, you know, accidental, stuff like that. There are different degrees of things. Guess what? In Judaism, there are also, in the Bible, different degrees or different categories of sin. And each category has a specific ritual for it in order to deal with it in the temple with the priest. So we see that Aaron here, when it comes to the scapegoat of, of the animal that's happening on the Day of Atonement, the purpose of that scapegoat is that the high priest is acting as confessor for the people for the different categories of sin. But what's the whole point of it? For on this day, he shall affect atonement, that's kapara, for you to cleanse, that's the third word, tahara, you. So we have atonement, which is kapara, cleansing, which is tahara. Though, so we have three vocabulary words, which is only done in the office of the priest, only attached to the office of the priest. So guess what? None of these vocabulary words will be related to the office of the prophet. So before I go on, since we have a small group, if there's anybody who wishes to have some type of clarification, this would be a good time before I then make the transition to the prophet. So just to recap, uh, what you are seeing right now with the Jewish people, if you have any Hebraic roots of what's going on, is that the Jews are acting as both the office of the prophet and the office of the priest. Until the second temple was destroyed, you know there was the office of the prophet and there was the office of the priest. There were two separate offices. I'm gonna tell you why we were able to fuse it, but the point is, is what you're seeing right now with the Jewish people is we're acting both as prophet and priest. But we just dealt with the priest and the priest has three vocabulary words, confession, <clears throat> atonement, and to cleanse. Vidoy, kapara, and tahara. Any questions? Feel no free. We're all good? All right. So just letting you know, in Judaism, if you are quiet, that means you understand and you agree. I appreciate the quietness. <laughs> and I just want to add, if anybody has a question, you can feel free to write it into the chat, too. And, um, you know, as we go along, and then we can answer them at the end. Okay. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is the vocabulary of the prophet regarding sin and atonement. And the reason why I'm doing this is you will never see in the Ten Commandments, thou shall repent. In fact, you will never see in the five books of Moses, thou shalt repent. If repentance is so important, why isn't there a clear mandate or directive in the five books of Moses? Doesn't mean that we don't have later day uh, uh, scripture that tells us that people are repentant and all that. But the point is, if, we, if this is about mandates and directives, we would expect some type of outright mandate. So let me just prove it to you in the case of Numbers chapter five, where the priest is there to help the person confess. Well, if you look anywhere in the office of the priest and any scripture relating that in the book of Leviticus, you will never see someone being mandated to do repentance. This is something that happens within the individual person that has to be moved to repent. Once you're in that um, sphere, that spiritual environment, then the priest comes in. So we don't see anything in regard to the priest in regard to being moved to repent. It only happens afterwards. So we're, we're gonna learn where is the root for repentance. And there's going to be another word that you should be incorporating into your Hebrew vocabulary. It's called teshuva. And teshuva has a root word of a shin. You can use the vav or not the vav, but the shin bet, which is, means shuv, which really means turn. Most of the time, teshuva means repentance, but really teshuva means to turn. That means you're turning to, you're going to learn, turn to your heart, 
turn to God, God turns to us. There's a lot of turning going on. This seems like the famous uh, 60s bands, The Birds, and uh, this famous song, Turn, Turn, Turn. There we go. We got some laughs with that joke. Excellent. I can use that for my comedy seller routine this evening. Perfect. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we'll see in the first four verses this code word that keeps coming up in Hebrew of shuv, to turn. And it's a prophecy that Moses says, he envisions that Israel will be sinning. But there's going to be a time, it will be when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I've set before you, that you will return to your heart among all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. Okay, so at this point in time, the Jews are spread out to the four corners of the world. After they sin, they've been thrown out of the, thrown out of the land of Israel. They've lost their stewardship of the land. And now God is saying, once you have returned to your heart, what will happen? You will return to the eternal, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. And you will listen to his voice according to all that I have commanded you this day, you and your children. Then the eternal, your God, will return your exiles. And he will have mercy upon you. He will return and gather you from all the nations with the Lord your God and have dispersed you. There is no other time in history that this prophecy has been fulfilled to this magnitude till today. Okay, you can go try, go back into the time of the Babylonian exile, where Ezra calls the people, not everyone came, only the poor and the illiterate. And when Ezra came in and he was trying to open up the second temple, people will just simply did not know what Judaism was back in that day. Right? They didn't even know what Sukkot was. They didn't know what the Feast of Tabernacles was. All right, so it's kind of interesting. So in this prophecy, is being lived out today. It's a, quite amazing. But in these four verses, we see the code word return happen. All right. And then Moses. So if you think this is just a Moses thing, I'm going to show you that the prophet uses this vocabulary in Isaiah chapter 55, verses six through seven, which is a verse that we use during this time of year. Seek the eternal when he is found. Call him when he is near. The wicked shall give up his way, and the man of iniquity his thoughts, and he shall return to the eternal, who shall have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will pardon. And Hosea chapter 14, verses 2 through 3, the first word is shuva, to return, O Israel, to the eternal your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Take words with yourselves and return to the eternal. Say you shall forgive all the iniquity, teach us the good way, and let us render for our bulls the offering of our lips. What we are saying out of our mouths can replace what was done in the temple. What's important here is that obviously the vocabulary word for the prophet is shuv, to return, to shuva. But also there is not the categories of sins as outlined in the office of the priest. The office of the priest, because these details, bureaucracy, he has to know with the bureaucracy which sin you've done in order to give you what you need to do in order to get the sin out for you personally. The reason why I'm bringing this all together is because you have to think of the priest as focusing on the individual. And the prophet is focusing on the relationship. So the best way I can describe this is if you know of a person who's gone 30 miles over the speed limit, passed a red light, crashed into another person, thank God no one got hurt. There was damage to both each other's cars. Obviously the person who did the damage will receive a ticket for speeding. The insurance companies will get involved. Everything will be paid for, right? A couple of years later, you want to get the points off from your, from your record. You take a driver's course. And poof, those points on your, on your record is gone. Well, think of the offices of the priest like a driver's course. You, 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 you messed up, okay? I confess, I did something wrong, you got me. What's my driver's course? Great, here's the priest. He's gonna give you your driver's course of that what you need to do. But we all know that once you take that driver's course, there was a confession that you made that you did something wrong, right? But that's for the individual. But on the day of the accident, when, when that person went into the other person's car, well, what did that guy go through? What did that woman go through? They lost their time at work. 
they had a bad day, they have to bring the car in. There is a relationship that needs to be repaired. You can't just simply rely on insurance and everything is fine and dandy. You put somebody, you hurt, you hurt their, you took, you damaged their property and you took time away from their day to deal with this thing because you, because the person went over 30 miles for, over the speed limit and passed a red light. You have to mend the relationship. So the priest is focused on the driver's course. Profit is interested into the two people, like the person that went into the other person, making sure that relationship is okay. Any questions on this? Before I make the transition to the next part. Okay. So uh, is there anything in the chat I'm missing, Lisa? Okay. No. Someone's hearing turn, turn in their minds. Okay. Fine. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> turn, turn. <laughs> All right. So next. There is one common word between the office of the priest and the office of the prophet when it comes to sin and atonement. And there's it's called slicha. Now, I know for many of you who have come to Israel, Lisa knows this. Slicha is usually excuse me, but that is not the biblical definition of slicha. Normally, you have uh, people bumping into you here in Israel when things were really crowded, cutting the line, slicha, you know, went over your foot accidentally, slicha. It doesn't mean excuse me. Slicha really means in biblical Hebrew forgiveness. But the difference between the priest and the prophet when it comes to the forgiveness it is in a passive voice from the office of the priest, but it's in the active voice when it deals with the prophet. So whatever is happening in the driver's course, then there's that osmosis thing of happening of, of being forgiven, where if in the return, God is actively forgiving the people. At the end result is everyone is forgiven. Question is, if you're really, if you're into grammar, this is very important. So in case anyone was into grammar, this is a good thing about passive and active voice when it comes to the verb of forgiveness. All right. Uh, are we letting in Lynn Jacobson? Where is I didn't see. Okay, okay I'm going to admit her. I uh, did. Okay, great. Uh, now I'm going to show you. So up until this point, we really haven't dealt, addressed with the, uh, with the concept of where does it say you shall repent? Well, I told you there is repentance. There is a person that helps you confess. That's the priest. We know that the prophet is interested in the relationship. So he's telling you to turn. But where can I find the directive to repent? So again, we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Listen to what, what, what Moses says in his farewell speech to his people. And one of the farewell speeches to his people. When you obey the eternal, your God, to observe his commandments and statutes written in this Torah scroll, when you return, there's that code word again, to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, for this mitzvah, commandment, which I command you this day. So the question is, what is this mitzvah? What is this commandment? So we, in our Holy Spirit moment, in engaging with scripture, the light bulb came on. And this is our direct mandate of to return, to repent to God. Let's see how it works now. Is uh, This commandment to repent, which I command you this day, is not concealed from you. And it's not far away. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and fetch it for us to tell us that so that we can fulfill it? Nor is beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and fetch it for us and tell us uh, so that we can fulfill it. Rather... This thing is very close to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can fulfill it. So here is the direct, we believe a direct um, directive of returning to God, to repent. But the, remember, we're using the language of the prophet. Not to confess, but to return. And to return is very simple. It's well, it's simple as far as what the Bible says. It's very hard for us as human beings because we, we tend to think, not you, you're all righteous people, but other people outside of this Bible session right now tend to think they're gods or they're in charge of everything. There's a lot of ego involved, right? So when you are turning and you're returning to God, 
you really have to sort of let the ego out and be completely selfless so God can enter in. A lot of times we block God out because of our own ego. But it requires when you're returning to God that the ego goes. So here is your mandate to think of, to talk about it. Now that I've given you some background as far as what are we doing as far as the fusion between the office of the prophet and the office of the priest. So let's just recap before I go into the final stage of our session together. We have the office of the priest. We have three vocabulary words that's related to it. We have uh, vidoy, which is confession. We have uh, uh, kapara, which is atonement. And we have tahara, which is cleansing. We have for the office of the prophet that the, that partic the particular word is teshuvah or shuv, to return to God. We have, a two, we have one common vocabulary word, which is slicha, which is forgiveness. Up until the, to the second temple was destroyed, we basically had both of the office of the prophet or the office of the priest or one or the other. But after the second temple was destroyed, we've lost both the office of the prophet and the office of the priest in the context of the Jewish people. We lost our land, we lost our sovereignty. Jews are being dispersed around the four corners of the world. What are we going to do now with these biblical holidays on the books in Leviticus chapter 23, when it comes to the birthday of humanity and the day of atonement? So the sages in their great understanding of what was going on and looking at the history of everything, they said, well, we don't have the office of the priest anymore and we don't have the office of the prophet anymore. We now are both prophet and priest. We do have the rituals. There are set rituals. We have the shofar. We'll have what was happening on the Day of Atonement with fasting or not wearing shoes. We'll say the exact things that the priest says on the Day of Atonement. All that's great. That's all office of priest stuff. But at the same time, we also have to look at where are our relationships, where our relationship really with God, and more importantly, our relationship with our fellow human beings. What is amazing on the Day of Atonement is that we are reading, as you know, in Luke chapter, I mean, just remember, it's Luke chapter 4, verse 15, if I remember. Um, Jesus comes in to a synagogue, and they are reading from the prophets. I'm sorry, it's uh, verse 17. He's, particularly, they were reading the, the prophet of Isaiah, from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. If you know, in Acts chapter 13, verse, I think it's 15, Paul goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they're reading from the law and the prophets. So it's important that you know that there's a concept of the Torah reading, the five books of Moses. There's a section each week that we read from, and there's a section from the prophets that we read from each week that correspond to the theme and the message of the Torah portion of the week. Um, also on holidays, we do read the Torah and we read the prophets. And what's interesting on the Day of Atonement, while we're fasting, while I can tell God, look, I've survived for 20 hours without a cup of coffee from aroma. This is amazing feat for me. I am really great that I am now caffeine free and I don't have my coffee. Look, God, what did I do for you? I gave up my coffee for you just to do all this. You know what God says to me? when we're reading the prophets on, on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, we read from Isaiah 57, 14, all the way to 58, 14. And as you know, God says, hey, I really don't care for your uh, fast. If you're still oppressing everybody, you can throw your fast out. But God, look what I did. I, I gave up aroma coffee for you. I know I, I went without any chicken soup or anything like that. Look how great I am. And God is saying at the essence, what we're reading is, that's very nice. You could do all the office of the prophet, uh, office of the priest stuff. You could do all the ritual. But if you don't have the essence of the prophet, then I don't need your fast. Okay. <clears throat> now, it's a big thing I'm saying. I'll even go further. We read the book of Jonah on the Day of Atonement. The whole book. We read it in our afternoon service. And this is a, a Jewish prophet, first time in history, 
who's called to go to the arch enemy of the Jewish people and tell them to repent. And he doesn't want the job. And all he does is say five words. Four days from now, you guys are gone. And they repent. So again, I'm showing God, look, I'm, I'm beating up my, my chest over here. I, I've, I've sinned. I'm doing the ritual of I sin. I'm going through the motions. I'm, I'm saying all the stuff of I sin, right? And what, what's happening when we're reading the book of Jonah? God is saying, that's nice. You know what happened with the arch enemy of the Jewish people? Five words and they all repented. And you still need to do 24 hours to do this. So what, why am I saying that? Because <clears throat> the office of the priest, as important as it is when it comes to the ritual aspects of what we need to do is confess. But at the end, the prophet is primary. And teshuvah and repentance, meaning the relationship that we have with our fellow human being, outweighs all that. So, as, 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 and hopefully one day the temple will be rebuilt. But until that happens, we're still in, operating from office of prophet and office of priest as believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're refusing all that in. Now, how can I prove to you this concept of prophet and priest? Okay, you guys are nice. You didn't you didn't ask me. Well, that you know, where'd you get this from, David? I mean, it's nice that you you threw you you're doing some smoke and mirrors. You told me about prophet and priest. It sounds all good, and I'm going to tell you that in Exodus chapter 34, we have our first day of atonement. This is when Moses comes down with the second tablets. Now, the reason why he's coming down with the second tablets is that the Jewish people are pretty much messed up. With the first tablets, Moses was late. They couldn't wait for him. They decided to, a, a group of people decided to go ahead and worship a golden calf. Right? They just heard from God not that long ago that we shouldn't do any idol worship. And boom, Moses comes late. And we're right back where we started from. God was angry and wanted to destroy the Jewish people. In fact, wanted to make Moses the new Jewish people. But what happens? Moses intercedes on behalf of the Jewish people, and the Jewish people receive forgiveness. We know that in Exodus chapter 34. In fact, the 13 attributes that we know of God is expressed in Exodus 34. But who was Moses? Moses was the prophet. And when, Mo when, and when Moses comes down with the second tablets, according to Jewish tradition, he comes down on the Day of Atonement, the 10th of the Hebrew month of Tishrei. So the first Day of Atonement was by the prophet. Every other Day of Atonement was then given over and regulated by the office of the priest. Because Moses knew that he wouldn't be around, right? He can't always be there. He's going to die one day. But we're going to need to have this ritual. We need to have this set up. But, at the, but, but we should never forget that the first day of atonement was done by a prophet. And was about relationship. It's about Moses interceding on behalf. He was confessor of the sins of the Jewish people. And because of that, God gives forgiveness. And here we are today, where we lost the office of the priest, where we lost the office of the prophet for the last 2,000 years. And what we're doing in this season, what known as the 10 days of awe, from the first day of Rosh Hashanah, of the biblical new year, to the day of atonement, is we are both acting as prophet and priest. So what does that mean for you? These are universal holidays. This is not a Jewish VIP club. Therefore, I would ask you, during this time, of the 10 days of law, specifically even on the day of atonement. And I'm not going to deal with the internal theological issues in Christianity. If you sin, uh, do, you, do you have the internal atonement or you don't have internal atonement? That's between you Christians. However, the world has not accepted God. The world is not where it needs to be. And therefore, this is an opportunity to reflect of where we need to work together as Jews and Christians to find out what we need to improve in order to have more God in the world. So 
I don't want you to look at this as a day of atonement and this is all about a Jewish thing and this is all over. At the end of the day, if the world is not where it needs to be, the responsibility is on us. Because you have your salvation does not mean you can shrug responsibility. All right. We're all we have a piece in the, in the in the next world. That's fine. But what do we have to do for the world today and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and the days in between are the opportunities to reflect of what we need to do better for God. OK, so that's my message for you today. David, could you take it one step further and talk about Tikkun Olam since you kind of left on that? Well, again, if you can't do so, this whole thing of repairing the world uh, has to be under the auspices of the kingdom of God. So you can't use half a sentence without knowing what the first sentence is, the first part of the sentence is. It's all Machot Shemayim, the kingdom of God to repair the world, not because it's Peace Corps, not because it's a nice thing to do. It's because we are being directed. Thank God we have the IKEA directions named God's Word called the Bible and it tells us specifically how to do it. Therefore, um, to repair the world, yes. But what does it mean to repair the world under the kingdom of God? So yes, but you need time to reflect on it. So this is the season to reflect. And what do we do during this time? We have to look at the relationships. And that means if people need, if their people are being oppressed, then we need to take the yoke of oppression off. If they need food to eat, we need to give them the food to eat. So. That's 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 how I look at it, at least. Which is why we have the traditions of uh, don't, you know, there's a lot of donating to the poor, donating to Correct. the that goes on during this period. Um, there is a lot of you're not supposed to go into Yom Kippur without asking the people around you for um, for their forgiveness in case you, you unintentionally sinned or said something offensive or. Um, and if you do do something offensive and you know about it, then you should write a letter to that person. You may have not spoken to somebody, you know, for a few months or may have done something. Those are some of the traditions that are all part of coming into uh, the Yom Kippur holiday um, and to atoning or, or to repairing a relationship with, with others. David, maybe there's a few other traditions you want to talk about that go on during this period? Um... Okay. No, I, I, I rather white. I mean, that happens. No, no, I'm not. I, I rather. I think this is. I think the most important thing is actually to really look at what the theology is. I'm not here to really promote Jewish practice. I think right now the why is more important, and then the reflection of really what we need to do. I'm not asking you to blow a shofar. If you want to blow a shofar, go blow a shofar. If you want to fast, you can go and fast. I'm not asking you to take on Jewish practice because you're not mandated to take on Jewish practice. However, I do ask if you can consider, like, how can we do better but with humanity? What do we need to do to better the situation? Uh, I know there, listen, the United States is not like it used to be uh, in certain aspects in the political arena, but it's affecting the everyday lives of people at the end of the day. So where does the faith community come in, both Jews and Christians, to, to address this point. And um, so th I, I think that's that's where I, I would like to, to focus on. Okay. Oh. So I know that Mal here has already posted a question that I will repeat. So basic question at the destruction of the temple, the order of priests disappears. Does this mean rabbis are not priests because there is no temple? But is rabbis it were never priests. So I mean, very, very important. Rabbis were never priests. Rabbi, a rabbi could be a from the, from the house of Aaron, that's true, but not all rabbis are priests. Is it conceivable that a rabbi might be a prophet or is the age of prophets over and no prophet will arise again? So, uh, so, so this is a great question. So uh, this is gonna be one of those things between Jews and Christians that we might disagree on depending which denomination or movement we're fr uh, which Christians are from. What I'm going to say to you is prophecy in the context of complete revelation where there were schools of prophecy being uh, that were open for people to be trained. And then you, you were like more of an Isaiah or uh, Mika or Micah or Hosea. I'm talking about that age of prophecy. I know there are people within Christianity that call themselves prophet, 
we what I would say is that I don't know if they would be on the same from a Jewish point of view. They're not on the same level as an Isaiah, for, at least from my point of view. Do they have a touch of prophecy? Yeah, what we would call um, what we call the Holy Spirit coming into the community of faith. And I've, I've, I don't know if I've talked with your, your group beforehand, but there are several categories of the Holy Spirit, which Jews and Christians definitely agree on. There's the Holy Spirit of uh, declassifying classified information. Uh, things that you're not supposed to know about, but you do know, happens through the Holy Spirit. And uh, I've, I, I did a teaching on this through Esther. Um, how did Mordecai know about the plot to king, kill the king? How do we know what Haman said in his mind? When he was walking into the king's uh, bedroom and he was suffering from insomnia and uh, and there's this whole dialogue in Haman's mind, like, how do we have access to that? So that's sort of like what I would call the unredacted FBI files of the Holy Spirit. So in that context, you still have sort of that modified version of it in today's age. And I would say even more because the Jews have returned to Israel. Um, and when that happens, there's more revelation and more amplified presence of God in the world. Uh, so, so from my from my point of view, anyone's calling themselves prophet, I understand that within the Christian context. But I would just say it's not on the same level as Isaiah or anyone like that. So that would that would be it. If you want to disagree with me, I understand that. But that's 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 from my point of view. So we don't have the age of prophecy. That means we don't have these prophets anymore. What we have is a, uh, a modified version of people able to look at what's happening in the world, detect where we are not in the same alignment with God's will, and through learning God's word and in prayer, detect that we where we need to improve in our lifestyle with God. So there I would say that that's where Jews and Christians definitely would agree on. We both we do have in our both spheres of influence people who who are really tuned into the spiritual plane between heaven and earth. Will the prophets arise again? Yes. Okay. So that 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 that's it. Short and sweet. Y e s. If you want me to go longer. Okay. Any other questions? Don't be shy. We're no question is uh, too silly to come to unless it's not asked or comment. Hi, Beatrice. What's resonating? It will help me to know what's resonating with you. Yes. Uh, Jonah asked, "Are there limits to forgiveness, abuse?" Are there limits to forgiveness and abuse? Very interesting. Okay, so this is an interesting question. Um, for, I, I can only give you from a Jewish point of view, uh, which would be, it's not easy to forgive, but forgiveness is not about the person who's done wrong to you. Okay? The person who's done wrong has to ask for forgiveness. It doesn't take away from you yourself coming to a point in your life where whatever is bad has happened to you from other people does not get in the way from your relationship with God. So I, again, I, I'll, I'll help you within Christian scriptures to help you with this. If you go to, I think there's a verse that says, if therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So I think that's in Matthew, if I remember correctly, right? Something like that. Okay, I will lay it, but that's the verse. The meaning that Jesus himself is saying, listen, before you go off and give me all this ritual, <clears throat> you have to mend the relationship between your fellow human being. Okay, that, that's the point. Don't come to the altar if you don't. Don't give me all of this. Why? Because again, you learn from Isaiah, from all the other prophets, all of this office of the priest stuff, can only work with in tandem of what's happening in your heart. And if you're only doing this for the ritual, then literally you are violating, you're going into a violation of idol worship. It's called fetishism. I can, you know, and that's not serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So in regards to 
abuse in people's own lives, I think the thing is, is that for the person, for their self-healing, they have to come to terms if they can go ahead and forgive. It's very hard for people who've gone through abuse. And I'm not saying this is easy, but forgive, this is never easy. And Joseph should be the, the prime example in the book of Genesis of brothers who, who, who wanted to kill him. And because they didn't like him, they hated him. And yet, you know, sometimes Joseph didn't, you know, stoke the fires for that. But it didn't have to be ending up that they wanted to kill him. And then he goes through a very rough time in his own history. But at the end, Joseph forgives his brothers. So you go from Cain killing Abel at the beginning of Genesis to the end of Genesis, where Joseph forgives his brothers for the attempted murder. And the concept is, is that we as the nation of Israel can't be a nation if our family can't see to forgive each other. Forgiveness precedes nationhood. That's what happens. Exodus can't happen without what's happening at the end of Genesis. And then it's really based upon the family structure, this dynamic of covenant, of a covenant relationship of family under the sovereignty of God is based upon trust on love. Now that works sometimes with family, but we know that there are dysfunctional families. But in a, in a good family, the trust is, is that I have your back and you have my back. Can you extend that family dynamic of trust based upon love to a nation that goes beyond the immediate family members? And that's been the test throughout the entire Hebrew Bible. A lot of times we got it wrong. Sometimes we got it okay. But this is a journey. Journey with God is not instant coffee. It needs to be brewed. It takes a long time. You need to find those beans. You need to grind it. You need to do the whole process. A journey with God takes time. It's not automatic. So, not, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, there's a question from Berlin. It's asking, can you please comment on Malachi 4? Malachi. Okay. 446, four, yes. How can we facilitate this in our families and our communities? How can we do that? I four, four, four. I just look at it for a second. Ah, very good. Uh, okay, this is about the, the basically the parent child relationship being repaired. How, how can that happen? So from a Hebraic point of view, it begins with, with actually doing. Uh, if you just constantly go ahead and say, I love my wife or I love my husband, but there's no doing to show the affirmation of that love, that relationship is going to end. Part of what faith is, and I wanna make this very clear, it's not about salvation, once you're in covenant relationship with God, then you need to do. So acts of it is the actual, we would say that the acts and directives that God has given. And yes, there are different directives for Jews than there are for Gentiles. But these directives that we share in common is the communion. Is where the relationship where God and the human being meet in the directive itself. So again, I'm not, I'm not trying to put you under the law, but whatever directives you are under, and you can look at the Sermon on the Mount, because Jesus put you on a lot under that, just uh, talks that took place over a period of time. You go to Mount the Beatitudes, there's a lot being put on, on just a simple person believing in, in Jesus. So those particular directives is, I would say, the communion with God, that this is the relationship that you're making with him. So first we have to look at it is that where God's law is coming in, it, are we viewing that from a point of view that this is divine? And therefore, once that happens, then you do have the incorporation that these directives are done out of love. God is not simply doing this to set people up for failure. He's doing this to have a relationship. The whole Bible is based upon relationships. Let me give you an example, and this will put in the context of Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. 
I know many of you think that the first verse is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I am sorry, well, I blow up that translation right now. That is not it. It is nowhere near that. This is not about a theology of creation ex nihilo. Great theology anyway, but doesn't mean it necessarily fits into Genesis chapter one, verse one. What God is doing in the first verse and what God is doing really in day one is the most graceful act that God has given humanity. What happens at the end of day one? God creates or creates light, right? And, and the thing is, it's not this light. It's not like Tom Edison stuff, okay? That's not what it is. The sun didn't happen until the fourth day. God uses familiar terms in unfamiliar ways in the unfolding of creation story in the first chapter of Genesis. What or means, biblically speaking, from a God perspective, in creating humanity to have a relationship with humanity, that humanity will freely choose that relationship, or light is really linear time. Okay? So when God says, or, that's mean God says there's linear time, meaning there's a past, present, and future. On the fourth day, God is creating something called cyclical time. We don't have, much, we don't have time to go into this, but let me just put into this concept to you. This is what happens. This is the beautiful thing of what God gives to us. God creates time. God creates the, the construct of a past, present, and future. God knows that in this relationship with humanity and humanity to freely choose that relationship, there's also going to be the option of denying God, not doing God, not rejecting God. So in any point in the relationship, while the person is still living, if any time that person says yes, there's always a future with God. The past can never overwhelm a future. That's why it's called the past. God knew. God is creating the ideas of how to make this relationship work with him. So that's what's happening on the first day. And it applies to what's happening in the season. And it's what's happening in Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Can the past stay in the past and not overwhelm a future if we're willing to say yes to both of us in our human relationships and to God. God understood that you always, this is the beauty of Rosh Hashanah. The day of atonement is about the future. I'm sorry, Rosh Hashanah is about the future. The day of atonement is about the past. You should have the day of atonement first and then Rosh Hashanah. And the reason why is if you think about the past, you will never think there's a future. So Rosh Hashanah goes before because there's always a future. Okay, now I have a future. I know where I'm going. Okay, in order to have, for that to happen, I have to know what I did in the past so I, can't, I don't mess up my future or I don't get off or veer off from the future. So all of this on, on what God is doing on the very first day is creating time, past, present, and future, and knows very well that any time in, in a human history, and you in a human's time, lifespan on earth, if, if a human says yes, then the past can never overwhelm the future. That's why you have this concept in Christianity, born again. If you really truly believe in the concept of born again, that means your past, you are not that past human being that you were once before. Well, that's a very Jewish concept. Shock, it's a shock. But it really is true. Is at the end because when you do teshuva, when you turn and you say yes to God, then you are no longer your past. There's only a future. So that should help with Malachi chapter four, verses four through six. Are there any other uh, questions this evening? Okay. So may all of you have a blessed sacred season of the biblical holidays. May God give us the ability to see each other personally and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see each other in Israel. And that's the blessing I give to you to this year. Thanks. And I wanna say thank you very much, Elisa, for the opportunity. Well, I, I wanna thank, thank you. you. I wanna um, thank you all for joining. And before we um, depart, I do wanna um, take a moment to with a little pitch 
And that is, um, you know, to, to, to hopefully, um, if you enjoyed the program and the session, um, obviously uh, any kind of generous donation would be well, well received. It's, uh, you know, we're not, we're not doing world tours and um, it takes a lot to put these programs together. And as you can imagine uh, um, with, uh, you know, it, uh, financially it is, a, it is a bit difficult and um, certainly I know David worked really hard and I really appreciate that. Um, so please, if you can give, please give generously. I'm putting um, um, our link. If you don't have our link here, let me just uh, get it for a second. No. All you have to do is put this link into your um, URL and um, one moment, and um, and then just click send in any amount, you know, that would be um, greatly appreciated. Um, so I, I want to thank you in advance for anything that you might be able to uh, to donate. <clears throat> and uh, please reach out to me if you have any other questions. We'll be putting obviously we'll be putting this into a, uh, sending this all to you tomorrow so you can review it. Um, it was a lot of uh, concepts here, and I'm sure you might want to take a, another moment and take a look at it. <coughs> and I will let you know in the next few days what our next session is going to be. But in the meantime, I, I want to wish you all, again, a happy and healthy new year. I want to also say gamar chatima tova, which means they, they, you, <coughs> everyone be written into the book of life, which is something that we will be saying on Thursday, Yom Kippur. <coughs> all right. And David, thank you. Thank you again very much. It's always no a pleasure. My pleasure. David does speak across the United States, so... Um, if anybody's interested, I already sent um, his email to Lynn. Reach out to me if you want to contact him. But I need some water, so I'm going to sign off. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you. Shana Tova. Thank you. Thank you. Shana Tova. Tova. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Nice to see Bye. you all. Thanks.